Welcome. Today we are beginning our discussion on the philosophy, a little bit on the life of Dionysius. Probably one of the most impactful philosophers, whoever was, if he was a philosopher or not. Fun confusion that we get to have with Dionysius, as we'll explain in just a moment. So where does all this come from? The idea that Dionysius may have been one of the most important philosophers if he even was a philosopher. That's a lot of confusion. And the last time we had some sort of discussion like this was around the person of St. Augustine, who wasn't trying to be a philosopher, or we might think the same thing about Abelard, who was trying to just be a reflective monk and greatly impacted philosophy. Dionysius is a different sort of character than both of these. In fact, he's so good, there's oftentimes two of him or more. It, and again, this doesn't help us at all in trying to understand anything about him. The original Dionysus, possibly the only Dionysus, but likely not, is a man by the name of Dionysus the Aeropagate. He was a judge of the Aeropagus who later converted Christianity by the preaching of St. Paul. You can read about this Dionysus in Acts 17.34. For those of you who are not up on your Greek, the Aeropagus, is also known as the Ares Hill, was a rock outcropping uh, that was a place for the early aristocratic council in Athens. So we get to understand a little bit about just him by the name Aeropagite uh, and connecting it with this. The Dionysius mentioned in the book of Acts, later served as the Bishop of Athens, according to another Dionysus, a Dionysus of Corinth. Again, we're seeing a fairly common name for many. By the way, for those of you unfamiliar with this, the modern name Dennis comes from Dionysius as well. In the fifth century, there were many writings that were accredited to this Dionysus, this biblical figure, Dionysus, who again, in Acts says, scantily even a verse, um, and connects it to him. There's writings of Dionysus that are then put upon this Dionysus. Further confusion also arises, especially in France, because the first bishop of Paris was also known as Dionysus. And of course, the French love things about the French. So of course, they said that Dionysus left Athens to go to Paris. An idea that is kind of almost laughable, but not entirely. There'll be other figures that will leave major important cities in the East and go to what become important cities in the West, but weren't that when they left. And this was missionary voyages and whether or not the Dionysius of the book of Acts, the Bishop of Athens would have left Athens to go to Paris is dubious because there's no account of him ever leaving Athens in such a way, except for those accounts that come out of Paris, trying to confuse their Dionysus with this Dionysus. Just to add extra confusion when we're talking about Dionysius, the work that we're reading out of likely didn't come from Dionysus the Aeropagite, as mentioned in the Book of Acts but rather came from somebody who, in all likelihood, lived in the later half of the fifth century. Scholars today will ascribe writings to this later figure and give them the name Pseudo-Dionysius or the pseudo Aeropagite. They were written under the name of Dionysius, likely to confuse the issue and maybe even to draw a highlight of a distinction that many people were trying to make between Athens and Jerusalem, that Athens is a city of philosophy, while Jerusalem that of faith, and maybe here in the fifth century, there's an idea of trying to connect the two uh, by drawing back to the bishop of Athens and this early figure that is found and grounded in the first century, and trying to then add the philosophy of Athens there too to show the import that Christianity had in shaping philosophy and vice versa. Just to add a little bit of extra confusion, we don't know anything about this person. 
We don't know if it was one person. We don't know if it was multiple people. We don't know if it was a man or it could have even been a woman and therefore the reason for the use of the pseudonym, if indeed that was the case. Likely from some of the language stylistically, etc., it wasn't even a Greek person, but a Syrian. Um, because the first clear citation we have of what is identified as pseudo Dionysius's work is by Severus of Antioch, somewhere between 518 and 528. So gives us the date that pseudo Dionysius would have been before this. And because this is the first place we're seeing reference to the work, likely came out of Syria, broadly speaking. But pseudo Dionysius and a work tells us that he was a former pagan in a writing that he had to Polycarp. For those of you unfamiliar with who Polycarp is, he was a disciple of St. John, the Apostle of Christ, and was the Bishop of Smyrna, who was also the teacher of St. Irenaeus, and Polycarp was also a martyr. So he's a very influential person in the history of the early church. This writing also mentions events that occurred in the first century to make it look as if this writing was taking place in the first century seeing an eclipse at the time of the crucifixion, the Dormition of Mary, and other pivotal and important first century events. What makes most people say that there is a pseudo Dionysius is that there's an engagement with Neoplatonic thought and some contributions possibly to the writing of Proclus be it either as a student of Proclus uh, or as an opponent of Proclus or even something that Proclus took some ideas from is at least largely debated. Uh, and some references of what looks like to Plotinus's work. Then again, this is tricky because Neoplatonism has its own long history and some of the ideas that might be seen as coming later could have had some mention earlier on. And if one person interpreted Plato's works one way, that doesn't necessarily mean that no one else could have interpreted it that way beforehand either. Again, this all just muddies the water a little bit. Dionysius represents the procession of all created things from God by an exuberance of being in the Godhead, much like ideas emanate from the One but here, unlike the one only being the one as important for Neoplatonic thought, we have God who does so and does so freely as the creator, as opposed to simply being a source. And we can't say anything more about the one. So we have this equation between God and the one. Also, Dionysius, pseudo Dionysius, however we'd like to identify the person, arranges the angelic choirs into triads. We have the first triad, the seraphim, cherubim, thrones, second triad, that of virtues, dominions, and powers, and the third triad of principalities, archangels, and angels. The closer the triad, uh, the more love and knowledge they have to God, just as the light closer to the sun is brighter and hotter is an analogy that's mentioned. So we have this triad of angelic choirs which again, looks a lot like the triads that Proclus talks about. Now again, that doesn't mean one person's ideas can't have influenced the others and there's debate as to which and where. For a while, Pseudo Dionysius was viewed primarily as a Neoplatonist and the West abandoned the philosophy of Pseudo Dionysius while it is more important in the East. And then there's this sort of return back to Dionysius in the West later on. Recent scholarship shows uh, that there's a little bit more philosophy in the West as a result of the work of Gregory of Nyssa, Clement of Alexandria, uh, to the works of Dionysius than that of Proclus. And so we've got a different sort of level of engagement. While early on everyone wanted to say this was due to Neoplatonism, it turns out it has its grounding in the Cappadocian Fathers and other important philosophers in the East, and Dionysius was never really abandoned in the East and kind of wasn't in the West, as his work will influence later interpretations of other events as well.
The question is, is what is the genuine Dionysus? And how do we look at pseudo-Dionysus in relation to Dionysus? The work for most people early on was seen as coming from the actual Dionysius until about the middle of the 15th century. He was quoted in councils and by leaders of the church in many debates with monophysites and others that existed in the East. And he was very important for Greek and also medieval scholars and scholastics, including Lombard, Bonaventure, and Aquinas. It wasn't until later that people started distancing this, but then some of that distancing has been re-looked at and it's really hard to understand. Who was this Dionysius? Was he one? Was he many? Is it a fifth century monk? None? Scholar? Who knows? So usually there's a division in the work between Dionysius and Pseudo-Dionysius, but pretty much all of the work that you think that you know of Dionysius probably came from Pseudo-Dionysius, if there was a Pseudo-Dionysius and it wasn't just Dionysius. Clear as mud, isn't it? In the West, Dionysius' legacy is different than it is in the East. In the East, there's much more of an engagement with not only Platonic thought and Neoplatonic thought, as well as Aristotelian thought. While in the West, kind of Platonism, Middle Platonism, and some emphasis of Neoplatonism find their way into the thoughts of people like Augustine, who then reinterprets things from a early scholastic, late ancient thinker, depending on where you want to put him. He's right there on that cusp. And while he wasn't primarily a Platonist, he borrowed many of the philosophical arguments from Plato. And so Dionysus is used a little bit to support some of these arguments, uh, and he's not fully engaged in because you have Augustine. But there are certain aspects of his philosophy and of his theology that then makes a huge impact in the West, specifically with discussions of negative and superlative theology, as well as a hierarchic conception of God and being similar to what we would see within Neoplatonism, as well as mediated illumination and spiritual knowledge gained by sacraments and angels. This will be very important for the works of Abelard and Lombard. Uh, and generally speaking, his impact comes about 300 years or so after his death, depending on when we're going to say the death of Dionysius or Pseudo-Dionysius is, depending on, again, who we're talking about. But it's usually not until after the time of Augustine, and there's a rediscovery, sometimes in connection to looking back at the works of Gregory of Nyssa, as well as Clement of Alexandria, Origen, reapproaching and combating the arguments of Proclus, and even drawing from some arguments from John of Damascus and making these connections as well. One of the greatest ways of seeing Dionysus' impact in medieval scholastic theology is by looking at his use of symbolic theology. That Dionysius used symbolic theology then makes it okay to understand and interpret things for medieval scholastics like Abelard, Lombard, Bonaventure, Aquinas, and a whole host of others. Dionysius shows that even revelation shouldn't be taken in a literal way, except for when it is necessary to do so. That there are times that things are analogous and should be understood from that perspective. Dionysius, for instance, quotes Psalm 78, that the Lord awoke like a strong man, powerful, but reeling with wine. If we were to take this literally, what does it tell us? That God sleeps? Sleep is one thing. That means God's not attentive. That's problematic. God is strong, God is powerful, that's good, but Having this power is now somehow taken away from this God because he's sleeping. And now that he awakes, what is his response? From a daze, from a hangover, reeling from wine? Does that mean God gets drunk? 
not only enjoys the fruit of the vine in creation, but overindulges? Something God recommends not happen? So how are we supposed to look at this verse? Well, we understand that there's symbolism involved. Dionysius points this out very clearly. Right, That the Lord awakens only means that God is removing this lack of communication between himself and the objects of God's providence. That there's a return to the work that has to be done. It's not just sleeping and resting, but engagement and responding to the issues and problems that exist with others. Both drunkenness and sleep are also dissimilar similarities, unworthy of the activities of God. They tell us something about God that is similar to us, but dissimilar to God. Right? God is a strong man, but stronger than we are strong. We might wake up powerful but reeling from wine because this is us. This isn't God. So scripture uses, according to Dionysius, phrases, images that are similar to us and things that we would know that speak to us and our conditions, but don't properly speak about God. Again, this phrase, this dissimilar similarities is often used with the reason for symbolic theology. In addition to Dionysius' use of symbolic language and helping us all to understand that sometimes people aren't literal when they're being serious, is also the use and importance of a theology of negation. Specifically, the technical term for this is an apophatic theology. Apophatic means telling us what isn't the case. Right? By setting limits, uh, also sometimes defined as a negative theology. This is as opposed to what's known as a cataphatic theology that is saying assertions about what is the case. Right? So this isn't the case versus this is the case. I can tell you I'm holding an object in my hand right now that isn't square and it isn't flat. What does that tell you? Well, it tells you some things that it's, it might be round, three-dimensional, it's a glass of water. Right? We, we can tell certain things about the qualities and we can define it in a negative sense, especially if you're more familiar with negative ideas than positive ones. And so Dionysius also advocates this sort of theology of negation. Many ways what we have developing is that we can't affirm many or anything about God, that God is beyond what can be affirmed. This is, by the way, very similar to Proclus and the notions of the one, although the reasons for it are terribly different. For Dionysus, the reason for this is that God is beyond our understanding. God is not one thing. God is beyond all of those things. You can't say that God is good because goodness isn't good, really. What you think of as good isn't real goodness. So God is beyond goodness. God is super good, whatever that would be, right? This includes even divine names. They are incomplete. So God is both father and not father, son and not son, spirit and not spirit, since our words are a poor substitute to what things actually are. What can be affirmed about an infinite God? Well, even the term infinite is a negation, not finite. By the way, we'll see very similar sorts of discussions later coming out of people like Maimonides, who his via negativia is essentially following the track of what Dionysius has done here. Still, there's an interesting discussion uh, with this apophatic theology, and even the works of Dionysius and those who spend time work in interpreting Dionysius and others. Father Thomas Hopko, former dean of St. Vladimir's Seminary, interprets Dionysius in a very opposite way to what a lot of people will. 
He says, Father, Son, and Spirit are perfect words for God since God revealed these names to us. But, as we would say of the case with the earlier interpretation of Dionysius, they wouldn't be complete. Father, Son, and Spirit are revealed words. Our understanding is only a shadow of really what Father, Son, and Spirit is. In other words, the words are not incomplete, but our understanding is incomplete of these words. Furthermore, our understanding of Father would be based on our earthly fathers and how they relate to God as Father, but that may or may not be complete in what God is as Father, because God is more Father than your Father is a Father, be it that he was a good Father or a bad Father. So what do we do with Dionysius? Is he a forgery? Are these works that of an imposter? Yes, no, maybe. By the way, it's still debated. In fact, the more people look, the more the debate grows. It was easy for a long time to just say it belonged to the first century Dionysius. Then, for the last 500 or so years, it seemed almost sufficient to just say, no, it was probably a student of Proclus and therefore it wasn't anticipating Neoplatonism, but was reacting to Neoplatonism. And then more scholarship dives in and says, well, actually, the roots of these discussions are not Neoplatonic from Proclus as much as they are from the Cappadocian Fathers, and so likely predates Neoplatonism. In fact, Neoplatonism and Proclus might have gotten these arguments because they were familiar with them. Okay, but does that mean that these ideas were also possibly something that could come earlier? And again, we're left with this fun confusion and this historical philosophy in theology and hagiography mystery. Even more so, there appears to be an, a bit of exuberance in placing all of the works that were credited to Dionysius as belonging to pseudo-Dionysius. Now some scholars are starting to reattribute some of these works to a potential first century Dionysius. Also, we need to understand that it wasn't uncommon for people to write in the name of someone else, not to be an imposter, but as a way of attributing a school of thought that they belong to. So many of the arguments of what we would see as pseudo Dionysius might have been based upon works of the actual Dionysius and saying, I kind of agree with him on notions of symbolic and apophatic theology and a few other things. Again, fun discussions to try to look at. In other words, there might have been a Plato school and a Dionysius school. And it could be more of an homage, the use of pseudo-Dionysius, than a ripoff. Uh, and while this is a long time established rhetorical device, a lot of people wanted to kind of say, yeah, let's move past that because it's hard to understand sometimes was this person a philosopher? Were these works his philosophy and theology? Or are these something else that come from another source? Let's spend a brief amount of time now actually addressing the works by Dionysius or pseudo Dionysius, depending on how we want to unravel this mystery. And remember, understanding that his work, Mystic Theology, uh, was very important, not only in the East, but in the West when we get into that high scholastic period. Use of Dionysius was used to understand, if nothing else, Neoplatonic thought, even if his works came before what we think of as Neoplatonic thought. It's still important in understanding that development and that shape and, and how the nature of the universe looks like. Notice the very beginning starts off with a triad same basic framework that we do have with Proclus and Neoplatonus. The question is, what is the divine gloom? Opening up, he says, this then be my prayer, but thou, O dear Timothy, by the persistent commerce with the mystic visions, leave behind both sensible perceptions and intellectual efforts, and all objects of sense and intelligence, and all things not being and being, and are raised aloft unknowingly to the union, as far as attainable with him who is above every essence and knowledge. So what do we here have really that he's writing to somebody named Timothy? Let's 
just kind of table who that could be for the moment and talks about mystical visions about the world being made up of sensible uh perceptions and intelligible efforts right we have things that we see and things that our mind can construct again this isn't novel to dionysius we have this basic construction with plato and aristotle let alone when we get to debates and discussions between empiricists and idealists and everything else along those lines he's not necessarily a rationalist of the type of descartes but again we start to see some of these ideas where we have sensible and intelligible data objects that are of sense and intelligence and things that are of being and not of being so right we have things that are that we can see and things that exist that we can't see be it mental formulations or or something else so in section two he says it is which is above every abstraction and definition and above the privations right there's there's something that's above all of our understandings and in section three he says the good cause of all is both of much utterance and at the same time the briefest utterance and without utterance right? the cause of everything to add nice thoroughly confusion is utterances speaking small speech and even no speech encompasses everything again knowing the idea of the apophatic theology that what is it we can actually affirm we can either cataphatically say everything or we could say also not these things and we have this sort of brief mention of how this would be played out because why it is super essentially exalted above all that there is this cause that is above everything beyond our notion of essence therefore super essentially and manifest without veil and in truth to those alone who pass through both all things consecrated and pure through which his holy inconceivable presence is shown that there is some sort of veil that separates us from understanding everything and yet some things make its way through dionysus in this work is making a clear analogy to moses to whom he names in part three here he says that moses is freed from them who are both seen and seeing and enters into the gloom of the ignacia the very gloom of the mystic and then moses is the one who in this divine gloom gets these little bits and abstractions of being able to see what is beyond everything else within which he closes all perceptions of knowledge and enters into the altogether impalpable and unseen being holy of him who is beyond all and of none neither himself nor other and by inactivity of all knowledge united in his better part to the altogether unknown and by knowing nothing knowing above mind very odd discussion that we're going to get from a mystical theology and it makes perfect sense that this is mystical how is it that you can know nothing and therefore know above all of what your mind would do how is it that you hold this both negative and symbolic understanding of god and understand more as a result of that how is it our mind and language and philosophy works when we know that certain things cannot be known and while this might be very confusing and some of you might simply go this is the writing of a guy who's calling it mystical it's kind of just a mystical experience what is this relation to philosophy Dionysus becomes very important in that sort of debate on how you need to see and understand philosophy throughout the middle era Albert the Great the teacher of Aquinas the person who explained Aquinas uh, his understanding of Aristotle drew heavily upon Saint Dionysius and the works of this mystical negative theology and so while it's hard for us to maybe make an easy connection we need to know that for certain schools of thought especially for medieval germanic thought 
which will follow Albert and some of his other students, including Meister Eckhart, uh, who's another one, and Towler and, and many others that will be students of Eckhart's, that this mystical theology is a different way of approaching philosophy. And maybe, just maybe, even some of our understandings from Berkeley, we could draw a connection if there's no matter and it's all in the mind of, of how our minds interact and relate with each other in this we don't know it but we do know it sort of way so again this this might be a stretch or difficult for some to, to grasp and i'm not asking for any of you to fully know it but you need to be familiar at least about the life and legend of dionysius because it is so important later on and another part of the work, he ends up asking, what are the affirmative expressions respecting God and what is the negative? He says the principal affirmative expressions representing God, Father, Son, and Spirit. How are the super essential Jesus takes substance and venerable human nature becomes part of the question. How is it something that is beyond essence in the way that we would understand it, super essential, right? Take on substance of what we have around us. And all the other divinely formed representations which belong to the description of God through the use of symbols. We have many symbols and many connections to symbols that change how we look and approach things all around us. Other scholars later on will spend lots of time talking about the value of symbolic language and the use of symbols and the use of symbols in understanding and expressing our connections to them. Symbols act to and establish powerful, pervasive, and long-lasting moods in us. You see the Apple symbol, Starbucks, Nike, or a whole host of others, and these are not just popular brands, but you have thoughts of, I like it, I don't like it. Uh, this sounds like a, a good comfortable thing or this sounds like a expensive horrible thing you have connections to symbols and therefore highlighting the use of symbols as Dionysius does helps kind of show the infancy of this sort of scholarship and the use symbols have in our mind instead of just relating back to the idea that there's a realm of ideas but there's use through symbolic understanding of the universe. The discourse in descending from the above to the lowest is widened according to the descent to the proportionate extent. But now in ascending from below to that which is above in proportion to the ascent, it is contracted and after a complete ascent, it will become wholly voiceless and while will be wholly united to the unutterable who is God and thus we see the necessity of the incarnation that in our minds is very much a very equal act to the incarnation that an idea needs to be placed upon an object and then returned back to our mind there's an ascent and a descent involved, and our understanding of it is only through this communication, this creation, this incarnation of the thought itself. And again, this is not exactly where Dionysus is going, but it's, it's there, and it allows for the framework of other philosophy to draw this out. So the incarnation is true, but it's also symbolic. Right, there, there's a real presence, a real Christ. He's not going to be a Feuerbach, uh, essence of Christianity sort of guy uh, at all, anyway, near that. But there's also symbolic value that the idea of the incarnation takes on. This approaching of the infinite with the finite, the unknowable, not just unknown, but unknowable with the known and the experienced. And this is part of the symbolic reality of this as well. There's also a good understanding that we need to know between symbols of reality and symbols for reality. Representation of existing things or a blueprint on how to move forward. Symbols 
are of both kinds. Sometimes they're just showing you what reality is in a different form, miniature or otherwise, and, and some tell you what it should be and how it ought to be, and therefore some of the notion of the incarnation is symbolic in this other way as well, telling you where you are to move forward. And sometimes they're used to communicate ideas and instructions beyond that, to give a separate meaning that it's not just a where things should go and here's exactly how to do it, but it's a directive and symbols have these powers as well. And so we can draw connections through all of these different notions of what symbols are and what they are to mean then for society and for you personally. So Dionysius is one of those figures to whom we barely scratch the surface. There's such a debate as to who did these works and are they in response to Neoplatonism? Are they the source of Neoplatonism before Proclus? Do they belong in the first century? Do they belong in the fifth century? Uh, where do they go from there? And there's this this fun mystery that, you know, if you're into it, it's, it, it's worth looking at. There's also the question of what do you do with mystical philosophy ideas that are connected to god and therefore we'll call it theology properly but they're trying to stretch your ideas beyond what they are and trying to say that reality is beyond what you see and even the world around you might be symbolic of a greater reality and this has huge import in eastern thought and in western thought as well when we get to those Middle Ages and we see how some people want to make Plato a little more mystical and others are trying to demystify some of this work, but yet philosophy is these weird squishy area where what goes between the rationalist and the mystic? Where is that line to be drawn? Because sometimes you take a quick little step over and it's not that hard. We could say this about a lot of other philosophers, that they are mystical, even though it doesn't seem so necessarily. They're, they're painting themselves as being very rational. Berkeley, Hume, appear in many ways to be very mystical. And yet their works are not trying to be this in any way. Even Kant, with our division between reality and the senses, is kind of creating this idea that there's a reality beyond just what we see and that what we want is a connection with the real thing with the ding exik the thing in itself but where does that go and how do we get there and so while many of you might reflexively say eh I don't have much for Dionysius one he's beyond important um, be it one or many or of what century uh, you'll see engagement and debate throughout all of medieval philosophy with kind of origin thought and Dionysian thought or Neoplatonic thought as advanced by and interpreted through the lens of Dionysius, depending on how you would like to move that. And knowing that much of Neoplatonic thought came about in reaction to Christian thought, it isn't crazy to see that Dionysius might be the better representation than Proclus and Plotinus as far as how to properly move and understand this, which then throws us into negative theology and symbolic theology and brings us right over that realm of mystical or quasi-mystical. So, food for thought. <laughs>